Hope I can get all the stuff in here. That's okay, we can get another knapsack. Hey, what are you guys up to? Oh, I'm choosing a course on this map. See, we're gonna take these flags out into the woods and place them along the route that I've chosen. Yeah, it's a real challenge. We're gonna need a map and a compass just to stay on course. Yeah, but why are you doing all this? Well, we're planning an orienteering meet. It's kind of like a contest. Yeah, see, people will get a map just like this one, and then they have to get from one flag to the next as fast as they can. What did you call it, Orion? What? Say that again. Orienteering. Finding your way around. Three, two, Today we're going to talk about how to find out where something is. Now, the first thing you have to do is to find out how far away it is from you. Then, in what direction it is. Now hear this, now hear this. Urgent message from the bridge. We proceed at once to make contact with Station Galileo. Pick up Ambassador Mahari and deliver him back to Earth. Where's the Galileo now? Milky Way Galaxy. Galactic longitude 180 degrees, 30,000 light years from center, fourth planet from star. That sounds far. It could take us a long time. Indeed it could. But uh, do you know where we are? Uh-uh. We are in the Milky Way galaxy also. And we are also galactic longitude 180 degrees, 30,000 light years from center, fourth planet from star. And practically within sight of Galileo. That's very near. I should say it is. It's practically just outside the window. I can't reach windows. How do you get to where you want to go? Kathy Sullivan knows how. She's an expert sailor and a student of the rocks and soils under the sea. She's also a backpacker and an airplane pilot. And she's getting ready to travel into space. Kathy is one of our astronauts. Kathy, we're planning an orienteering meet. Want to help us? Sure, sounds great. Is this where you're going? Yep. See, we plotted a, a course from Pine Cliff Lake all the way over and around up to Boulder Hill. Oh, yeah, that's around in Burnt Meadows. I've done some geology traverses through there. What's that? Well, one of the first things you do if you're a geologist and you're going out to explore a new area is you, you just traverse that means to go across and you go from road to road for instance and you take a map like this that shows you the hills and swamps and lakes and as you go along you mark down all the different kinds of rocks that you come to and, and where they are is that what you wanted to do when you were going up be a geologist oh i think i really just wanted to explore and understand the world and what different places were like and so forth and and just by seeing different rocks and things like that you got interested in it yeah in fact i really got interested when i first started thinking about beaches and how they formed and one of the professors where I was going to college showed me what some beach sand looked like under a microscope and that was it. A yeah. whole new world. <laughs> I wanted to do that. So if you're an astronaut, I, I understand what you're going to be doing with your geology background. What are you going to do with it? Well, as an astronaut that hopes we'll go off to the moon again or huh. to Mars someday, I'd like to take what I know about geology and study another planet. We've, we've sent some really sophisticated spacecraft out to Jupiter and Mars and stuff. We know a good bit about them, but, you know, Columbus had to go across the ocean himself, and That's I kind of right. want to go to Mars myself. <laughs> <laughs> have, have any of you ever seen a rock under a microscope? I haven't. I haven't. That's a really interesting perspective on something that's very familiar. This is one of the rocks that I studied in Norway when I was over there. Oh, look at that. And we've cut it into a very thin slice mm -hmm. and put it under a special microscope. What we can do with that now is start to look at grains of minerals that are so small you can't even see separate ones with your eye. And we can tell what they're made of and get a, a basic idea of the different chemical elements in the rock. And like I said, start to put together the jigsaw puzzle, where it came from and how mm. the earth is working. That's really beautiful. It's amazing how things look different when you look at them up world. If you couldn't see anything at all... You mean like out in the middle of the ocean on a dark, cloudy night? No, I mean right here on land. 
Think of how you'd get around if you couldn't see anything at all. I mean, if you were blind. Ordinary map sure wouldn't help you at all. No, nope, you'd have to carry one in your head. Roddy? Hi, how you doing? I'm Mark. Yeah, how you doing? Okay. Good, okay. Uh, I'm going to spend the day with you. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. My name is Lottie, and I'm in my last year of junior high school. I wasn't born totally blind. I had some sight. I remember when I was about five or six years old, I could see letters and colors. Now I can just see light and shadows. But it doesn't mean I can't get around. Can you show me around? Do you know which room this is here? Yeah, that's the boys' bathroom, and it's um, 219. 219, you got that one. And which one is this one? That's a closet, and it's 217. You're right, sure is. What about this that's one the, right here? Uh, that's the girls' bathroom, and that's 215. How did you know each one of those rooms? Do you memorize it? You know, whenever I needed help, I would ask somebody, what room is this, what room is that? And they would tell me, and I just remembered. Uh-huh. So you, what do you do? You count the steps from one room to the other? No, I just count the rooms. And I know that each room mm -hmm. is, on this side of the hallway is an odd-numbered room. Uh-huh. Oh, and then on the other side, there is the even, even number. Room. And they all go down by two on this side, you know, because it's 19, 17, 15. Well, you're right. Okay, what's the, what's down the rest of the hallway? Can you show me there? This way? Yeah. Okay. Right down here. I noticed that you never tap your cane back and forth. I've seen some blind people, they tap their cane back and forth. Yeah. You kind of run it along the crack of the wall there, like right, yeah. right in there. Yeah. How come? Well, it's a lot better if you keep it against the wall because if you keep it apart and you walk like that, it'll uh -huh. just like veer like that. Uh -huh. Instead, if you keep it against the rim, you always have a guideline for your cane. And what about in the street? Do, would you normally just tap it back and forth? Yeah, in the street we tap, we tap it back and forth. And you just use your hand against the wall like to guide yourself? Yeah, like that. Uh-huh. Just to keep it alongside. Now, I noticed you hit that right there. Do you know what room it is? Yeah, that's 254. Now, and when you hit the corner right there, mm -hmm. What does that tell you? Does that, what does that tell you when you hit in a corner like that? Some doors, when you hit them like that and you continue like that, there's a wall right there. Oh, so I see. I put my cane like that and I feel away and then I feel down like that to see if I can go on. Uh, do you get a sense of how big this place is? Because it's pretty large. Yeah, you can tell because you can hear that it's very, because of the echo, you know. If you talk, you hear sort of like an echo in the background. Do you get a sense that there's some trees in here too? Yeah, you can hear the um, leaves rustling. Oh, you mean like right up in here? Yeah. You can see every leaves rustling in here. Uh-huh. That's how you can tell there are trees there. Yeah. Now, we over here, there's some, there's some dirt right in here. Yeah, that's dirt. I mean, how do you tell that's dirt? Well, it's sort of soft, right? And now, if you were in here all by yourself, how would you navigate this place? I would trace this with my cane like that, like I was doing this side. Right. I just trace the place so I know where where I was going. Oh, and then you'd get an idea, a picture oh. of it in your head. Yeah, and then I would just follow that picture. Little by little, I would learn how to go around it perfectly. So it's like making an imaginary map. Yeah. You ever check out this globe? Is this is mm -hmm. this specifically for you? No, it's specifically for everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody can use this globe. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I noticed it's got a lot of ridges on it and yeah, everything. That it's raised like most globes aren't. Mm -hmm. These raised parts right here, these are mountains. If these are Rocky Mountains, mm -hmm. you go to the west. Over here is the equator, right here. Down here? Yeah, right, that line right here. How'd you know that? Well, you see, because up here is, is the um, Tropic of Cancer, which is exactly which? 22 degrees north mm -hmm. of the equator, and mm -hmm. down here is the Tropic of Capricorn, which is exactly 22 degrees south of the equator. And there are three lines between it. Mm -hmm. So I naturally picked the middle line. And that's the equator. That's the equator. Yeah. Five or six months after mm -hmm. I learned how to use a cane, that you started me, uh -huh. started to teach me how to cross the street. Uh huh. Uh, there's something coming, but I think we're all right. We got the light here. You want the Well, and now we're gonna cross over this way here, over Sixth Avenue. And now when I come to a street, uh -huh. I used to just square off. Mm -hmm. It means to like get yourself straight before you cross. Right. And just check with my cane to see if I'm straight, right? Uh -huh. so when that traffic goes on your side, I go with the traffic. Oh, this uh, this traffic over here on the right? Yeah. When that goes, I go with the traffic. 
He's going, I can throw. So you've got to listen for him. Yeah, I've got to have total concentration. It does take a lot of concentration, doesn't it? It does. Mm -hmm. I feel that I've learned a lot since I've started to use a cane, but not everything yet. I'm not even halfway through yet. I'm going to take buses, I'm going to take trains. I'd probably be scared at first, you know, because I wouldn't know how to find a seat and trying to find out what bus it is and where the money goes. But I'll get there. Hey, I have no doubt about that. I'm sure that as I get older, I'll be able to travel to a store, go to work, and, you know, go to school. But that's not all that I want to do. I want to get out. I want to see the world. I want to see what life has to offer. I want to meet new people, travel in different environments. And that's why I'm learning to travel, to see the world for myself. Okay, if I decide to go orienteering with you, how am I going to find my way around in the woods? Look, you'd have a map, right? Or else you could use landmark clues like clumps of trees or rocks or open spaces. Yeah, and you can use your ears. If the map shows that there's a flag near a stream, you just listen for water. Right. Yeah, but if you're standing in the middle of the woods with nothing but trees and bushes around, how are you supposed to know which way to start walking? Oh, well, then you'd better have a compass with you. Yeah, else you'll get turned completely around. I've got one in my knapsack. You know, I've used a compass for years in scouts, but I really never understood what made them work. Well, the earth is really a big magnet, you know. So you have to remember that there's sort of a, a magnet sitting inside here, lined up from here to here. Yeah, from the North Pole to the South Pole. Right. And so the compass needle, which is just a little magnet itself, lines up along the Earth's field lines and tell, helps you find out which direction to go in. That's how you set a course when you're sailing, too. Okay, Mark, you sighted land, and we've now gotten the chart out to see where we are. The chart looks like a map. Well, a sailor calls it. It's a chart. But let's look around a little more and see if we can get a good view of, of something else that'll help us out. Uh, what's that right there? Oh, there's a buoy. It what looks like it? it's uh, black and white. Okay, yeah. black, white. Well, let's come down on the chart and see where a black, white whistle would be here. Here we have one. Okay. Okay, well, that's on our port side, so why don't we put this to show us where we're going. So where are we headed? Well, we're going home to Mystic, right over here. Right. So can we just go straight like this? Well, there's a problem, though. All these rocks are between us and home. So there's a good passage in here, Watch Hill Passage. Why don't we head for that and around that red bell? All right, well, how are we going to get there? Well, we're going to take our course. Okay. Right from there to there. Two. And that lands right on the north-south line. Oh, I see. So now we know we have to head north. That's right. Well, do you think we can see it from here? Well, we can't quite see it from here but we can get there another way using the compass. We've plotted a course of north to this bell buoy. Uh -huh. So here, we've got our lubber line right, lying right on zero, and that's what we want. Well, we can't head much further north than that, We're right on it. Okay, now we've got the gyroscope spinning up. I can show you some things about how we navigate on space and at sea. This wheel spins really fast, and what it will do is it will tend to keep this, this bar, which we call an axis, always pointing in the same direction. So, Lisa, why don't you pick that up by the bottom there? Yeah. Now, turn all the way around with it, and I'll prove to you that that's what it'll do. It's pointing that way. That's right. It's still pointing it's still in the pointing same pointing direction. That way. Watch your head. Because <laughs> it's still playing there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. How does it do that? Well, it's a property of anything that's spinning fast enough and is heavy enough that it will try and keep the axis it's spinning around 
in the same place as it was when you started it. And we use these in space navigation where we don't have an up or down or north or south for the compass. Mm -hmm. And we use them at sea on large ships like research ships where there's so much metal around you that a compass would wander all over the place. Do so most ships use the stars to navigate by, like Columbus did? Sure, we use them both at sea and in space. We do it a little differently uh, in space. We just use it to verify, make sure periodically that we know just where this axis is pointing. And we take a special little telescope and point at a known star and run it through our computer to make sure that the axis is oriented properly. And we measure the angle between this axis and that star. And then we can just make sure that we know how accurate our navigation still is. But this, this just slowed down, it stopped. What would you do if that happened in space? Well, we have it set up in space systems so that they can't stop. We have motors inside the bearings that turn oh. these things around and keep them moving at high speed. This is just a very simple gyroscope. To take this up in space, you'd have to be able to move it in all three directions. So we actually have them set up with different swivels here and here and all around. And you can move the spacecraft anywhere you want around that gyro and it will just stay right where you first started it. Mm -hmm. Is this what you use on all missions to get to the different planets or wherever you might be going? Sure. Interplanetary travel uses just this kind of system. Jupiter is 500 million miles away. Saturn is a billion. At this telescope in Tucson, Arizona, I found out how we can get close enough to see what these planets look like. Can you show me how this particular telescope works? Mm-hmm. First, we have to uh, raise the platform up a little bit so we can get up closer to the eyepiece of the telescope. And then we need to point the telescope. What kind of things will I see when I look at that? Well, Saturn is a uh, planet which has a, an atmosphere, has a lot of clouds in it, and then, of course, Saturn has those beautiful rings. Just look at you? Yes. How far away is it? Saturn is a billion miles away. Oh, wow. Are you studying anything in particular about Saturn right now? We understand the weather on Jupiter quite well now, and now we're attempting to see how Saturn differs and why its weather is different from Jupiter's. It's beautiful. Say I looked at Jupiter, what kind of things would I see? Well, Jupiter looks something like Saturn, except it's covered with bands of clouds. And it has a large storm, which we call a great red spot. And that storm is so large, it's actually larger than the Earth. Now, what the computer is doing is it's putting colors through here in a changing way. And that allows us to pick out certain details. In other words, the color is sort of related to the brightness. So this spot right here, that round spot, is the red spot you were telling me that's about? That's the great red spot. Now, Harold, if we could switch that over to black and white, we would see it now. This is, this is the way the image would actually look. And here's the great red spot. It is about as big as the Earth. The Earth would fit in just like so. What have you been able to find out about Jupiter using this machine? Well, what we found is that, the, first of all, the red spot is very high. That tells us that it's a giant storm, which is carrying air way up, higher than the rest of the clouds, much as uh, a giant hurricane does on the Earth. Is there any way of getting really close to, say, another planet or? Another star besides the telescope? Yes, uh, not stars, but uh, we have been able to get close to other planets. We put instruments like small telescopes mm -hmm. on these spacecraft, launch them with a rocket, and then these spacecraft sail through space and come actually quite close to other planets. Brad showed me some photos of the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 missions. They were launched in 1977, and this animation shows them on their way to Jupiter. The goal of the first mission was to study the weather, cloud formations, and the surfaces of some of Jupiter's moons. As it got closer to Jupiter, the spacecraft took this series of pictures. The closer it got, the more detailed the photos became. We can see the clouds and bands in the atmosphere and the violent winds on Jupiter.
This moon, seen moving across the face of the planet, has more volcanoes than any other object in the solar system. These pictures were put together into a movie to show the swirling of the clouds. The action is speeded up several hundred times to show the motions of the band and the wind spinning around the great red spot. Voyager also discovered a narrow ring around Jupiter and then sped off to fly through the rings of Saturn. My name is Daniel Potter. I live at 20 Oak Street, Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York City, New York State, Eastern Seaboard of the United States, on the continent of North America, in the Western Hemisphere of the planet Earth, in the solar system. in the Milky Way, in the local cluster of galaxies, in the universe. <whistles> That's where I'm at. talking about all the ways people have of finding out where they are in the world and of exploring places that are very near or very far. You know, Kathy, I find it really fascinating that you're going to help explore the universe. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks a lot for helping us plan our orienteering course. Oh, it's been a great day. I've really had fun with you guys. Good. But you know, orienteering is still kind of similar to space travel in a number of ways. How is that? Well, they're both a matter of keeping track of where you are and knowing where you want to go and figuring out how to get there. You mean if we get to be really good at orienteering, we can get to be astronauts someday? Hey, that'd be neat. Yeah. It's not a bad direction to head in. Mm -hmm. Not at all. <laughs> Sure to watch next time when 3 to 1 Contact brings you the exciting adventures of the Bloodhound Gang. 3 to 1 Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.